We've seen from the history that there was a long period of time when understanding subsurface hydrology was non-quantitative. Now we want to talk a little bit about how the quantification came about. Starting with Darcy in 1856, he was hired to understand exactly how water moved through the aquifers of Dijon and was able to show the remarkable fact that the flow of water was linear with a gradient in potential. This is quite different than if you're riding a bicycle where it goes with a square of your speed, the resistance. So this linearity was a fundamental feature and it's represented very specifically in the equation now carrying Darcy's name, Darcy's Law, showing the absolute linearity between the area through which water flows, the permeability of the material, and the gradient of potential. Now, Darcy's Law applies only to strictly saturated system the way Darcy was thinking of it. And very shortly after, Boussiness came along and said, hey, can we model an aquifer that's draining with that same equation, now having an area of soil which is saturated, obeying Darcy's Law, and an area of unsaturated soil with a flux resulting from the changing water table. This was, it turned out to be a very successful analysis, which we still use to understand the recession analysis of rivers um, bordering aquifers. And so, as early as 1877, we'd already started to see some application to unsaturated systems. It was as late as 1899, still exploring saturated conditions, we saw Schlichter doing some remarkable work of how wells might interact. And this shows how uh, analytical tools that he was using, just hand pencil calculations, he was able to come up with remarkably accurate predictions for how aquifers behaved under complex driven situations. And so this is showing the power, again, of Darcy's Law within the contemporary framework of the mathematics of the time. To apply Darcy's Law to unsaturated systems had to wait for Buckingham, who identified that the coefficient of hydraulic conductivity could simply be taken as a function of the water content. That is to say, you have a soil and its hydraulic conductivity is a function of how wet it is. So instead of having a constant conductivity, we now have a variable conductivity associated specifically with the water content of the soil. So that we now call the Buckingham-Darcy equation, where we have the conductivity represented as a variable quantity. Green and Amped, near the same time in Australia, were trying to solve the problem of an unsaturated flow from an irrigation canal. And what they did is much like what Boussinesque had done earlier. They said, hey, we will take it a saturated portion of our, of our system, where it's associated with the, wet, the water source, and then there'll be a wetting front, which exerts a certain potential driving the water laterally. This concept of a saturated with a, with a capillary-driven process gives very precise predictions for lateral transport and actually can be used vertically as well, where you combine gravity and capillary wetting fronts. And so this was, again, the first use of unsaturated flow with capillary-driven um, uh, processes. So Green and Ampt uh, contributed that in 1911. It wasn't until 1927, though, that Richardson said that he could put the Darcy's Law, or the Buckingham Darcy Law, if you will, in combination with the conservation of mass. And so that's saying that if the water coming in one side is different than the water going out, there's going to be a change in moisture content. So now we not only have a, a, a moisture content dependent conductivity, but we have a time dependent system. And so Richardson uh, wrote that in 27, and then L.A. Richards independently came up with the same result in 1931. So we'll refer to that as the Richardson-Richards equation, where we're applying Darcy's Law with the conservation of mass. The parameters here so far, we have the hydraulic conductivity, et cetera, are a function of the media. And in the 1950s, we have the, the, the Miller brothers, Bob and Ed Miller, recognizing that you could take the same equations of flow, in fact, they started from the Navier-Stokes equation, same equations of flow for any porous media, and identify the role of scale. And so you could take two media with different scales, adjust the equations appropriately, and come up with predictions from one to the other system. So you can measure all the properties of one soil and predict the properties of a new soil. And this is a very powerful additional quantitative tool for making predictions in unsaturated systems. So what we've seen then is that from the 1850s, we've been developing this quantitative framework for subsurface flow. We need to recognize it came kind of from the bottom up. It was developed for aquifers and has been applied more and more to soils. And so certain 
frameworks are reflecting that history of its, of its adoption. Nowadays, we can solve these problems analytically using the results of, of, the, of our forefathers, or we can now plug these, numerical, these differential equations into numerical models and solve them numerically. In fact, both techniques are very powerful. The analytical allows us to see explicitly what's going on with particular parameters and how they affect the outcome. Whereas the numerical allows us to span much more complex systems and understand interacting scale-dependent behaviors that were never able to be represented in a simple analytical expression.